The NBA schedule is starting to trickle out just a little bit with the expectation that the Bulls and many other teams will have their full schedule released by the end of the week. The Chicago Bulls got shot out of Christmas Day games again. We're going to talk a little bit about that. We're just going to talk about Nikola Vucevic and his future with the Chicago Bulls team and ask, could Nikola Vucevic become a bigger trade chip than even Zach Levine? And then lastly, we're going to talk about Julian Phillips and his expectations coming into next season. We're getting to all that and more right after this. You are now tuned in to Chicago Bulls Central, your number one place for all Chicago Bulls news and content. What's going on, Bulls fans? Welcome to another episode of Chicago Bulls Central, your number one spot for everything Chicago Bulls related. I'm the host here, Hayes, but more importantly, you guys can follow the channel at Bulls Central Pod on every social media platform we happen to be on. With that being said, let's go ahead and get into this content for today, y'all. And so the NBA schedule is starting to leak out, um, as I said in the in the cold open. And Chicago Bulls, of course, have been left off of opening day, which isn't really a surprise there. Like, I don't think anybody's clamoring to see the Chicago Bulls on the day that the, that the NBA season opens. But the Bulls also got left off of Christmas Day games yet again. Now, I'm of the, of the age where I remember the Bulls had a matchup on Christmas Day every single year. For a long time, it was against the Knicks, right? And then, you know, moved on to other teams outside of that. But, you know, unfortunately, the Bulls are just at a place now where those marquee kind of days on the schedule for the NBA, the Bulls are just left off of. And I think that does show that, you know, the NBA is not expecting the Bulls to be, be very good this season. Now, you have your Bulls fans that think that this team is going to be much better than necessarily I'm expecting or the NBA is expecting. And to that credit, we'll see, right? And it's up to the Bulls to start showing that they are a franchise going in the right direction before they're going to start getting some of those games. It seemed like initially the Bulls were going to, right? That first half season with Lonzo Ball and, and before him and Levine got hurt, like, I think, I think I said at that time, like, hey, the Bulls are going to be on more, you know, going forward into next year. But then it's just been less and less return on investment since that season. And now the Bulls sit at a place where they've gone into another pseudo rebuild um, on the fly, right? Going younger with their roster. And it just ultimately, like, the, the Bulls aren't going to get a lot of looks on the marquee uh, games. We'll see when the full schedule comes out. Like, do they play on Christmas Eve? Do they play on New Year's Eve, New Year's Day? Stuff like that. But overall, once again, just the Bulls, you know, it is what it is when it comes down to it. Like, this team is not going to, uh, you know, be getting those games. And so it comes down to the Bulls having to show. Now, I do think the Bulls, and I've said this multiple times, I do think they're going to play an exciting brand of basketball next year. Like, I know that's not something that everybody uh, thinks, uh, right, especially with, you know, the defensive limitations. I should say a more exciting brand of offense I think that they're going to play uh, next season. I think they're going to spread the ball around a lot more. You know, you got Zach Levine coming back to, you know, moving into that role of, like, moving to the threes, probably going to get a, a, a ton of shots as well, like getting to see him and kind of Kobe go to work with with Josh Giddy as the playmaker there and what he's able to do playmaking-wise, those type of things. So, you know, I do think that this team is going to get out have a quicker pace. They were 28th in pace in the in the league last season. And so I think they're going to try to turn some of those things around. But overall, like, uh, again, the Bulls, and especially for my Bulls fans that are either, either abroad or live outside of the city of Chicago, league pass is going to be your best friend yet again. And I know some of you, some of you legally streaming games, stop that. No, I'm just playing. Do what you got to do. Oh, uh, but, um, you know, it's going to be another league pass season for my, for my Bulls fans outside of the city of Chicago. If you want to see a lot of Chicago Bulls games. And so that's just what it comes down to. Like, and, and we'll see what, what comes about from that. But let me know what you guys think. Do you think, do you miss the days of the Chicago Bulls playing on Christmas Day, things like that? I mean, it's still exciting to have NBA basketball on on Christmas Day, stuff like that. But, like, do you miss it? Because it, uh, it used to be almost a foregone conclusion that we were going to see the Bulls on Christmas Day. And now we've been a handful of years where that's just not the thing that it used to be. Let me know what you guys think down below. Now, I do want to talk next up about um, Billy Donovan. So Bleacher Report really released a list of coaches that are on the hot seat or have the hottest seats in the 2024-25 season. And Billy Donovan actually got listed as number two on that list. Now, I always think to, uh, people who make lists like this, unless they kind of follow the ins and outs of each franchise intimately, they may kind of miss some of the intricacies. But let's go over this list and then we'll circle back to Billy Donovan. And if I think Billy Donovan's seats actually hot next season or not, right? So they have number one, Taylor Jenkins with the Memphis Grizzlies on this list. And, you know, when it comes down to it, um, I think that even Taylor even Taylor Jenkins being here is like, 
you realize that the Memphis Grizzlies were were riddled with injuries last year, right? And so, you know, that that brings something about when you have to look at it in, in that in that case. But when it comes down to it, like, I know that this Memphis Grizzlies team does have expectations. And when you keep your roster largely the same, now they do have, add, have added Zach Eady, who projected to probably be their starting center next year, unless they do something different. Um, but with John Morant being suspended and then losing uh, out, more games out to injury last year, I don't know if they look to move on from him anytime soon. Um, but it did say this. They recorded it John Hollinger saying Memphis also fired the majority of Jenkins' assistant coaches just before the combine. That always a tell the head coach isn't a great spot. I mean, listen, and that's going to circle back to what we talk about Billy Donovan in a second here as well. Billy Donovan was listed as number two with the second hottest uh, seat with coaching. Willie Green was listed as number three with the New Orleans Pelicans. I can kind of understand that one. Chauncey Billup is number four with the Portland Trailblazers. I, I think that cl- team is clearly in a rebuild, and I think they've he's, he hasn't even been on that job long. So I don't know if I agree with that either. But Chauncey Billups listed as number four, and then Quinn Snyder listed as number five with the Atlanta Hawks. So we'll see. Um, they also do list Doc Rivers on here as well, kind of as a throw-in uh, at the end of that. And I do think that the Milwaukee Bucks, if they have another, another disappointing season, could look to do something different with Doc Rivers. I know they gave him a lot of money with years, but that comes down to But let's circle this all back to Billy Donovan. Is Billy Donovan's seat hot for the Chicago Bulls? Now, keep in mind, this is a coach that signed a secret extension. We only found out what that extension was because of the talk of him possibly going to Kentucky, which ended up not happening, of course. But we then found out that Billy Donovan has two years left on his his contract, only one year after this upcoming season. Now, when you look at it, when it comes down to it, Billy Donovan, they mark the fact that he has a 60% win percentage in his five years with the OKC Thunder. But then you look at that uh, around the Chicago Bulls, and it's right around 50% as far as with the Chicago Bulls. But again, it's been less return on investments each one of those years. And when you look at the team going into a different direction, they note that with DeMar DeRozan and Alex Caruso gone, uh, that you know maybe Billy Donovan isn't the best fit here for the Chicago Bulls and what they're trying to do. Keep in mind, Billy Donovan did end up leaving the OKC Thunder because he didn't want to pallet a rebuild. Now, that ended up being a bad decision because the talent that they end up having there he wouldn't have been in a straight rebuild for long, but they are they are that. Now, the question is, how much in, in know, us knowing and kind of having a deeper knowledge of the Chicago Bulls' inner workings, how hot is Billy Donovan's seat, really? I say this. It's not hot at all. And maybe that's a hot take. Maybe, And I'm not saying that it should or should not be hot. I just don't think that it is hot. When you look at how this front office, and they talk so oftenly about how collaborative it is with their relationship with Billy Donovan. And that is something that this front office does appreciate and and want, right? When you look at that. I also think that when you gave a, a coach an extension after having, you know, seasons that the return on investment has gotten worse and worse, that also puts you in a spot where it's probably not going to happen, right, for you. So um, the question I think comes down to this is that it, how, how good are the Chicago Bulls this season? If the Bulls do look like that team that I'm, it seems like the Chicago Bulls front office is hoping that they are, that they're going to compete for a playoff spot or whatever else, and Billy Donovan is developing the young guys this season, he's playing more of the young guys, we adapt to a quicker pace, which Billy Donovan does like to play at a quicker pace than what the Bulls have done the last few seasons. If those things happen, could the Bulls look to keep Billy Donovan? The bigger question isn't for me how hot his seat is this season. The bigger question for me is what happens at the end of this two years that we have left on Billy Donovan's contract. Where are the Bulls at at that point? That's what I think the bigger question is here. You know, not to say that there isn't a world in which Billy Donovan could be removed at the end of this season. Um, I think if the Bulls struggle mightily, let's say that they do have, God forbid, like a 15-18 win season. Some, let's say 20 and below. If they have that type of season, I do think that things could start changing around. But you guys know as well, I have the mindset, not necessarily saying that I want to see it, but I do think that Billy Donovan could move to the front office if Mark Eversley ends up taking another job to be the president of basketball operations at a different team. So that's kind of my mindset just in how, uh, you know, Billy Donovan being in with the Reinsdorfs, how he's talked about how he talks to Jerry almost every day, those type of things. Now, I don't know if that's everyday offseason or if that's just everyday during the season. Those two things would be very different. If they talk every day, even when the season's not going on, Billy ain't going nowhere. You, you might as well take that, ball it up, write it away. Billy Donovan is going nowhere. If he talks to Jerry Reinsdorf every day, even in the offseason, 
Billy Donovan ain't going nowhere no time soon. But the question maybe that we should be asking is, isn't, is Billy Donovan's seat hot or not? But should it be? That's the question that we have to ask her when it comes down to Billy Donovan, at least in my, uh, in my uh, estimation, is that should it be? Should Billy Donovan's seat be hot? And I say this, the Bulls have not had the level of success, regardless if you look at the injuries up and down the roster, the fact that the Bulls have had this hugely flawed roster with like missing size and things like that. All those things are true, and, I, and you cannot take away from that. But to me, you have not had the level of success. When, you're, when your record gets worse year after year, other than your first year here, where that was clearly a year where you weren't trying to win, you were trying to see what you had here, I think that you have to start looking at what does that mean for, for, for Billy Donovan and for your coaching staff overall. Billy Donovan has had one season of being over 500 as a Chicago Bulls coach, and that was the year after Lonzo and DeMar and Alice Caruso got here where the Bulls had a 56-win percentage, winning 46 games. Other than that, it was 40% the year after that. I mean, 40 wins the year after that, 39 wins the year after that, 44 or 31 wins his first season here, which was a 72-game season. The Bulls have disappointed every step of the way, and I'm not blaming all that on Billy Donovan. Be clear here. I'm not blaming it all on Billy Donovan. But we've seen coaches fired for less that wasn't their fault. And that is where you have to ask yourself. And a lot of Bulls fans are asking why Billy Donovan has such security with the fact that the Bulls really haven't accomplished anything. You look at the development part, like the, the, the pillars of coaching, right, wins. I mean, we haven't been the worst. And with how the Bulls have dealt with injury and things, some people could make the argument that it's actually been a okay job considering what the state of the Bulls roster has been over that time. You can make that, that argument. Not saying I agree with it. But you can make that argument. Then you look at development. Uh, I mean, it hasn't been great, but it hasn't been as bad as what some people say either. Um, definitely you look at uh, Kobe White. I would assume we've definitely developed while Billy Donovan has been here. We can talk about whether you attribute that to Billy Donovan and his coaching or you attribute that to what they do in the offseason. But you still have had players like Patrick Williams, Dalen Terry, who hasn't played a lot. Julian Phillips, who we'll talk about here towards the end of the show, who actually played a lot more than what I think Bulls fans give credit for. Um, but you have those things, right? And so ultimately, should Billy Donovan's seat be hot? I'll say this. It shouldn't be cold. It shouldn't be this thing where you have ultimate job safety because we just haven't had that level of success, in my opinion. And maybe this season opens up some eyes. Maybe this season changes some things. That remains to be seen. But let me know what you guys think down below. When you hear this from the Chicago Bulls, um, and you hear this question of how hot is Billy Donovan's seat? Do you think he should be on the hot seat going into this year? Or do you think we should say, hey, we've gone younger, we've, we've basically rebuilt this roster with moves still yet to come, and let's see where Billy Donovan and this roster is at the end of the two years, and then we'll see what we have. At least that part, you have a coach, the same voice there, the same player development department, and much like they pointed out as well with Memphis's coach, the Bulls overhauled the assistance for Billy Donovan. Now, some of those guys wanted to go elsewhere, which I think should still be a sign regardless, but if you're looking at it and saying that, you have to also Factor in your assistant coaches. If you made a change to what the to, for what John Hollinger said, John Hollinger said, if you made such changes to your assistant staff, does that mean that there's not as much faith in the head coach? Let me know what you guys think on that down below. The next topic that I want to talk about, guys, though, is Nikola Vucevic. Now we've talked a lot this off season about Bill, about Zach Levine and his potential move. I haven't talked much as of, of Nikola Vucevic because I thought that the Bulls may want to take a look at what they get back for Zach Levine first before they make any other moves. But the question I want to throw to this one is, will, will Nikola Vucevic actually become the Bulls' biggest trade chip heading into the trade deadline? And the reason why I say that, the $20 million contract, which is basically what Rose players are being handed out now, which is a lot more manageable, the fact that it's a shorter contract than Zach Levine's on top of that, and the fact that if you have defenders around Nikola Vucevic and you can allow him to keep his big ass in the paint, that there's still enough on the bones there that you can look at and say, hey, maybe we can, maybe we can use Vooch, right? Vooch is still a guy that's going to be a double-double machine. He's still a guy that's going to go out there and get you 18 and 11, basically. He's still a guy that's going to go out there and shoot close to 50%, and maybe even more than that if he stays his ass in the paint and stops trying to become a three-point shooter. If you're a team that has defense and three-point shooting, Nikola Vucevic, and you need a center, Nikola Vucevic is definitely one of the players that could – maybe make some sense for you, right, when it comes down to it. You look at a team like, I know I mentioned them earlier, right, is that you look at the Memphis Grizzlies, for example. They have Zach Eady there, and Zach Eady is going to be their starter. But if Zach Eady, maybe they look at it and say, we need somebody with a little bit more scoring, right, and maybe we want to bring Zach Eady along slowly. 
Vooch with Jaron Jackson Jr. next to him, a, a player that actually does block shots and is a better defender, may make some sense. There. I'm not saying that look out for that, right? But it could make some sense there. There are teams that Vooch could make sense at the trade deadline because of the bigs around the NBA. And I do think that I'm not saying that you're going to get a whole lot back for Nikola Vucevic. Maybe you can get a protected first, maybe, maybe, and that's if that team is a near championship contender and their first is going to be in the 20s, maybe at that point, right? But the Bulls can do something. So there's an, a chance in where Vooch, you know, the Bulls, I don't believe that they shot Vooch heavily. I do think that they've listened to deals to kind of see what that market may be for Nikola Vucevic, but I just don't get the indication that they've, like, heavily shot Vooch. $20 million contract, 14% of the salary cap space, and easily matchable contract by most teams in the NBA. And again, even if you need to go a little bit above that, right, to send out some bad salary, the Bulls still do have $4 million below that luxury tax to where they can absorb more than that. So I think that's something to look at for. Um, but let me know what you guys think. When, I, when you hear that Nikola Vucevic, could he become the Bulls' biggest trade chip by the players that they're willing to give up? We know that if they made Kobe available, if they made Io available, he'd be much, much bigger trade chips than, for example, what a Nikola Vucevic would be at that time. I just don't expect them to try to get to try to make those guys available. So that's in the framework of what we're talking about. But let me know that. I know Bulls fans, especially my boy C Dub, are kind of over Nikola Vucevic. And I can't, you know, I can under well, I can understand why that is, right? Has Vooch been disappointing? Yeah. Defensively, especially. Has Vooch been, you know, has, has he stayed his ass in the paint as he tried to talk about before? No. And I do think that if Vooch was ever just stayed in the paint, we can have a very different outlook. But we'll see what comes about with that. Now, before we go, I do want to talk about another Bulls player. Yesterday, I talked a little bit about Daylon Terry, right? I talked about, you know, how he gave back to his community, how Daylon Terry could, is he ready to kind of take on a larger role? I want to talk to have that kind of that same conversation about Julian Phillips, right? When you look at the Chicago Bulls rotation, there's going to be a guy, and I've talked about this heavily, there's going to be somebody who's left out of that rotation and this does, does not play. Billy Donovan goes eight to nine players deep, and usually that ninth player and a tenth player play very inconsistent minutes. So with that said, we know what the rotation is going to be for what we, we have an idea of those main players being in that rotation. And the question is, is where does Julian Phillips sit in that with the Bulls going younger? Does Julian Phillips pass up a Torrey Craig while Torrey Craig is a journeyman in the NBA, but he's a guy that you know exactly what he's going to bring and how he's going to perform both on both sides of the ball. But do you bring in a Julian Phillips because of the energy that he can play with, because of the upside of his shooting, because of the fact that you traded two second round picks to get him? You were aggressive about going out there and getting him, and now you're going younger with your roster, right? Julian Phillips, who's added some weight on, which we know that he needed to do. He came in at 6'8", uh, I mean 198 pounds. I believe last that I heard now he's 6'8". Uh, I think he measured at 6'7". I mean 6'9", uh, though. But he's, he's more closer to 2'10", right? Still slight, right? But there's still a versatile forward that can be used for you. Now, I know people are going to say, but Hayes, Julian Phillips, Billy Donovan didn't play him. And that's where you're actually wrong at. Julian Phillips played in 40 games last season for the Chicago Bulls. And when you consider the fact that he went down, he went down with injury in early March, he actually played in more games than he did not, right? Almost playing in half the games of the season for the Chicago Bulls and missing the last month and a half of the season a little bit more than that, right? So that's something you also have to look at. How many games would have Julian Phillips played had he not went down? You're talking about him being closer to the 60 mark. If that happened, so, and Billy Donovan started trusting Julian Phillips a little bit more as the season went on. You look at, for example, he started off in the, in the uh, month of October, averaged 2.5 minutes per game. Then in December, I mean, yeah, then in November, 5.7 minutes per game. Then in December, the month where everybody was down, Julian Phillips actually didn't play much. He averaged 3.1 minutes per game. But then in January, 13 minutes a game. Then in February, he played more games. But 9.6 minutes a game, some of those games it was seven and brought the average down. But then in March, before he went down, March 13th, 13 minutes per game. So the question is, is how does Julian Phillips come into training camp? And does he come in in a manner in which Billy Donovan looks at him and say, whether it's because of the energy, whether it's because of the shot blocking, whether it's because of the, he's a better three-point shooter, whether it's because of the chemistry with like an iota sumo of getting out in transition, finishing at the rim, those type of things. Does that give it the edge to where Julian Phillips can make his way to getting minutes for the Chicago Bulls next year? Now, some people are going to say, well, we're, since we're going younger, we should be playing the young guys even more anyway, and I would agree with that. But this is a Billy Donovan coach team. 
You can never take that for granted that Billy Donovan is going to do the things that kind of make sense to us as fans. But I do think that Jillian Phillips, if he comes into training camp and he competes, he fights hard. He has worked on the shot, which he did look much improved in summer league. But it's going to come down to Julian Phillips making the rotation because of his energy and because of him figuring out something that he can bring to add and change to the dynamic of this team. And Julian Phillips, per 36 minutes, even though I don't like that stat at all, his per 36 was solid. Not great, but solid. 12.7 points per game, five rebounds per game, two assists, and a block and a steal per game. That's what the per 36. Now, again, the per 36, especially for a player that didn't average a lot of minutes, is not the greatest stat. So take that, ball it up. It is what it is there. But Julian Phillips showed flashes last year. The question is now is how much of those flashes can become consistent for Julian Phillips to earn a role on the Chicago Bulls team. And for a team that has a lot of young guys, but we don't exactly know, a lot of our young guys, shout out to Pat the designer who said this, yeah, we have young guys, and we have young guys that we think that we have talent, but those young guys are still a question mark, whether it be because they just haven't played enough minutes or whether it be because we don't know if their skill has been refined enough for us to say that they can do any one thing on the court. And Julian Phillips is the perfect example of that. Can he bring that around? I guess we'll see. Make sure you guys are following the show at Bulls Central Pod. You can send us any feedback, questions, comments, concerns. Bulls Central Pod at gmail.com. Lastly, if you want to leave a text message and our voicemail for the mailbag, the number to do so, 773-270-2799. We're the number one spot for everything Chicago Bulls related, but that's thanks to you guys. And like I like to end every episode on, go Bulls. Love you guys. See red if you can, y'all. Peace. This has been a presentation of the Break Break Media. Media.